Hot off the presses, we finally have some good high level nutrition recommendations for female athletes. Today I'm gonna to explain what they mean for you, your nutrition coaching business, and for your female clients. My name is Dr. Mark Morris, a nutrition coach with thousands of successful client transformations over the last decade. Many of which are female athletes, so I have a keen interest in this and I'm sure you do too. Let's get to it. The use of scientific evidence has completely transformed and shaped the nutrition coaching landscape. We have approaches and systems that get clients results reliably and consistently. But here's the unfortunate part. These approaches are based on data that was done primarily in men. That's right, just 50% of the population. And if I'm being honest, probably only accounts for 20 to 30% of your clientele as a nutrition coach. We're gonna go over this discrepancy in a second, but it's a sad state of affairs. Knowledge that can only really be half applied and half worked to a female clientele until now. Brand new position statement from the International Society of Sports Nutrition, or ISSN, on nutritional concerns for the female athlete. I'm gonna recommend that you read the entire article, which I've linked in the description below, but for now, I'm gonna summarize what's important for you to know as a nutrition coach. A few things get me excited about this paper. Number one is the past position statements from the ISSN. Some of the past ISSN position stands, I guess I've been calling them statements here, have been really, really well done. Particularly the nutrient timing and diets and body composition papers have been huge for the nutrition coaching industry. So when I saw that this paper came out for female athletes, I was really pumped. Leading me into my next point, which is number two, more specific research and applied knowledge is desperately needed for female performance athletes. The authors of this paper highlight a powerful anecdote at the beginning of the paper, which I think is particularly telling, so I wanna read it. The issue of male bias goes far and the literature is rife with examples of science that ignored women, even when women should have been a target demographic. For example, in the mid 1960s, observation that women tend to have lower rates of cardiovascular disease until their estrogen levels dropped after men menopause spurred researchers to investigate whether hormone supplementation was an effective preventative treatment. And here's the kicker. This study enrolled 8,341 men and no women. Now there are multitudes of reasons for this, none of which are okay. But this type of bias is why we're in the situation that we're in. More recently though, these concepts have been explored in the research and coaching world. One of the more popular examples is the book that Lyle McDonald published in 2017, the women's book, which is to the best of my knowledge, one of the first lay texts that describe the relationship between the female hormonal cycle and performance and nutrition. Namely the idea that women just aren't little men and can't be treated as such which has plagued the sports science and coaching world for far too long. Now I've always enjoyed Lyle's work. It's thorough and it's well organized, but some of his recommendations fly in the face of the paper we're gonna to discuss today, which highlights a few things. Number one, coaches need to proceed not cautiously, but somewhat skeptically when we interpret this data. This is a complex area where really smart people can look at the data and come to completely different conclusions about what it means. We'll talk about that later, but also number two, we need to further stratify these groups of female athletes, especially when considering their primary goals. So today in this paper, we're gonna be talking about performance and performance athletes who may have body composition goals and could even benefit from improving their body composition, but that also isn't their primary focus. And you as a nutrition coach know that most of the time, clients have three primary goals. They're typically performance, body composition, and overall health. And sometimes these pursuits can be somewhat contradictory. The more you push in one direction, the more the other one suffers. So if you're a nutrition coach that works with more body comp clients and not so much performance athletes, some of the findings today might not be as relevant for you, but there is still overlap, so it's okay to learn about this stuff. But without further ado, we gotta talk about the implications here. So here's the key considerations outlined in this paper for nutrition coaches. Last thing to keep in mind before we start, and I mean this sincerely, this is my interpretation of this entire area as a man, so I'm gonna tread carefully moving forward. First thing we gotta talk about is understanding the hormone hormonal profiles. Female athletes have unique and unpredictable hormonal profiles that are gonna influence performance and nutritional needs. And this is different from their male counterparts. Male hormones typically fluctuate in a 24 hour cycle. I actually had a hard time finding a good visual of this because it's so simple and straightforward. But for men, we have testosterone spiking in the early morning and then it tapers off throughout the day with similar nutritional oxidation and utilization through time, which is just not the same for females. The female hormonal cycle typically lasts around 28 days, but can range anywhere between 21 to 40 days. With tons of individual variation, some females are gonna have debilitating symptoms, which are obviously gonna impact performance, whereas others are largely going to be unaffected. 
As you can guess, this is going to impact performance and nutrition. The paper did point out the emphasis for nutrition coaches and coaches to recommend tracking hormonal status against training and nutrition and recovery for reproductive age athletes, namely because of this dynamic. So in the normal menstrual cycle, the first 14 days are gonna be made up of something called the follicular cycle, where estrogen is the dominant hormone. This makes carbohydrate the primary fuel at rest and also increases insulin sensitivity. Generally speaking, this is accompanied by better athletic performance. But there's one thing that I wanna point out, and I'm gonna talk more about this at the end of the video. There is disagreement between researchers and industry experts about how big these differences actually are and if they're even meaningful. And that's okay because we're learning more about this and coaching is also where science meets application. So sometimes we need to make some best guesses to really help people. Now this is gonna be a different situation in the last 14 days of the cycle, which is the luteal phase. So in the luteal phase, progesterone is gonna be the dominant hormone, although estrogen also spikes a little bit later. But this does make fat the primary fuel at rest, as well as increasing energy expenditure and hunger levels. As you can guess, this dynamic may impact nutritional needs, and therefore the thought is that there could be different nutrition recommendations and exercise protocols in these different phases. Also, it's still worthwhile for peri and premenopausal athletes to track their individual patterns to determine their own unique nutritional needs. But that's the first big thing here is that there's differences in the hormonal cycle. The second aspect that's important here is adequate energy intake. The primary nutrition consideration for all athletes, but specifically for female athletes, is achieving adequate energy intake to meet their requirements while optimizing something called energy availability, which is gonna be the difference between the energy that's coming in or the energy intake and the energy expenditure. This is an important concern because low energy availability leads to poorer performance, but also detrimental health effects like loss of menstrual cycle and poor bone health. Proper timing of meals, especially in relation to training, is crucial for improving training adaptations and performance. Number three, and this is where things start to get a little fun, hormonal status and carbohydrate intake. As previously mentioned, sex-specific hormones are gonna have a differing impact on fat metabolism as well as carbohydrate metabolism. And it's important to note that female athletes should meet their carbohydrate requirements throughout the entire hormonal cycle. But adjusting carbohydrate intake based on where they are in the hormonal cycle, such as increasing carbohydrate intake for those that are in the active pill cycle if they're using oral birth control or during the luteal phase, could be helpful. Which, and this is where things get interesting, is the opposite interpretation of some other authors in this space. Mainly less carbs and more fat during the luteal phase, which I'm gonna talk about later in the video. But that's where we're at with carbohydrates. Next up, we have protein intake and timing. Here's the deal, for premenopausal, for healthy menstruation, and for oral birth control users, consuming protein as close to the beginning or completion of exercise is recommended to reduce amino acid losses as well as retain lean body mass. This individual protein dose should be anywhere between 0.32 to 0.38 grams per kilogram of body weight, as well as its individual dose should fit within recommended and accepted sports nutrition guidelines for total protein intake, which is typically 1.6 to 2.2 grams per kilogram per day. Nothing totally new here. Make sure you're eating enough total protein, but you'd be wise to put some of it around training or sport. Now during the luteal phase, higher protein intakes are advisable, and that's due to the catabolic actions of the dominant hormone, progesterone. Lastly, we got number five, fluid and electrolytes. Female sex hormones can impact fluid and electrolyte status. Female athletes may be more prone to low sodium during times of elevated progesterone or in menopause, which means that consuming enough total liquid and electrolytes is going to be crucial, particularly in that luteal phase where female athletes are gonna have less fluid around and available for sweating. Now, those are some of the highlights from the ISSN position statement. Now, I do want to point out that there are some other very well done papers in this area, especially meta analyses that have pointed out to less variation in exercise performance during the cycles. And although there are changes to nutrient oxidation in these cycles, it may not mean much to the big picture. Here's one good example of this type of paper, and I want to quote what the authors concluded about this study. The results from the systematic review and meta analysis indicate that exercise performance may be trivially reduced during the early follicular phases of the menstrual cycle compared to all other phases. So that's the first thing to 
point out. And this actually reminds me of some of the work that I did in my own PhD. During this time, I was measuring short chain fatty acids in the fecal samples of some sick patients. Yeah, that's right, nutrition people study poop. You can call me the poop doctor. Just don't call me Dr. Skidmark. Anyways, we noticed that in the sicker patients, they had higher amounts of short chain fatty acids in their fecal samples, which was interesting but we couldn't determine what it actually meant. Did this mean that the gut bacteria was actually producing more of these amino acids and it was better? Or did it mean that it was actually absorbing less and it was worse? It's tough to really determine the mechanism through which this stuff actually happens. And this is a really similar situation. We see the differences in fuel and nutrient utilization through the different phases, but it's hard to determine what this means for the athlete. For the female athletes in this paper, it may mean that more carbohydrate is recommended to perform at similar levels with the emphasis on performance which is different than what the body comp and physique concern crowd has recommended. Meaning when improving your physique is the primary concern, less carbs and more fat might be recommended. Here's what I absolutely do know though, is don't hold your breath for everyone to agree about this stuff, or at least interpret it in the same way. Here's what all this stuff means though for you as a nutrition coach. When working with female athletes, nutrition coaches need to consider the unique hormonal profiles of their clients. This means adequate energy intake as well as proper meal timing and tailored carbohydrate and protein recommendations. And attention to fluid and electrolytes will optimize performance and overall health. So to me at this point, there is a chance that some of this is an overgeneralization and none of it is as important as it's made out to be, which may also mean that we might be making things more complicated than they need to be. And simpler, less cyclical recommendations are going to be more effective. Only time will tell though with the correct research. For now, if I'm a nutrition coach focused on my clients, I would assess my athletes on a phase by phase basis. As researchers continue to explore more female specific nutrition, which they should, we need to include more females in research and include hormone detailed information so we can all learn and benefit. Now, as great as all these tips are, if you're really serious about starting a nutrition coaching business, the next thing I'll have you do is check out this video I've linked out right here. Today, you learned all about nutrition recommendations for female athletes. Next, let's learn a little bit more about working with advanced athletes. Check it out here and I'll see you in the next video.